Underhill, Part 2, an original short story by Charlie C.C. Thomas. Tuesday, July 1st. Silence and darkness blanketed her skin, with only hints of crescent moonlight filtering through the boughs of the trees. Gone were the birds and bugs and creatures who called the night home. Gone was the unseen life beneath the stars, with all its busyness and disquieted stirrings. Only silence and darkness remained, hidden from the moon's eye by the trees like great hands and entwining fingers. Sarah stood, bathing in the cool night air, skin bristling in the wind that made the leaves dance and sing. She stared into the darkness, through the gray trunks of the trees, past the shadows and vague silhouettes that became a wall of black. She watched without seeing and breathed in the cool of the night, the silvery damp of moonlight, the warmth of the leaves, the musk of long-gone animals now fled, and the smell of freshly churned earth. She knelt, face forward and expressionless as she sat on her heels, hands in her lap, unblinking eyes dry and stinging. She sniffed the air. There was something else amongst the cool and spice and earth, something sharp. She looked down at the corpse of a fat songbird and stared. Its once vibrant blue and black were bleached to shades of gray. Its black legs were bent and crooked, one close to its body, the other broken backwards. Its wings, once beautiful and full, were crumpled and twisted. One dangled over its back, the other almost disconnected. Sarah reached with both hands and sunk her thumbs into its guts with a wet pop and slick. She held it up, blood still warm and dripping down her forearms, and spread it open. The skin tore as feathers fluttered around, its head falling like a wilted flower, black eyes staring at her. She reached inside and pulled out its organs, crushing and squeezing until they laid in her palm, glistening black and purple in the flecks of moonlight. She set the steaming mound to her lips and slurped them in chewing as copper and filth ground between her teeth and trickled down her throat. Blood dribbled on her chin, dripping onto her thighs as she swallowed. She grabbed the bird's head and twisted until it snapped free, tossing it into the darkness and breaking its ribs in two. She leaned forward to keep the blood from covering her legs and sank her teeth into the flesh, scraping against the little bones, pulling the tough, stringy meat free and grinding it. Her mouth sat ajar, eyes forward and watering, staring as sloshing and spittle filled the air before her face in a mist. She swallowed, then stopped. Something was crawling on her skin. She dropped the dangling, disjointed skeleton and lifted her hands in the light, watching tiny black things scurry across her fingers and up and down her forearms, caught here and there in the blood. Something moved on her face, scuttling up to her eye, her nose, her mouth. She licked it away and crunched it between her teeth, then leaned into her hands and lapped at the blood, taking the ants with it. She moved like a starving cat, giving its last for a good meal, gaze piercing the darkness. The silence screamed at her, for her, as the darkness danced in a swirl of invisible color between the gray trunks and whistling starlight. She found its eyes, pale eyes staring back, knowing, watchful, and sharp. She blinked, spilling tears over her cheeks as she lapped and gnawed at her own hands and opened them on her bedroom window. She froze, eyes flicking down to her own hand between her teeth. She slowly opened her jaws and pulled the hand free, cold fire setting in the bite mark, and looked at it in the pale silver of moonlight. No blood, just angry skin and bruises. How am I going to explain this one? She thought, smirking before rolling onto her back. She stared at the ceiling, swallowing her never-ending river of saliva, ignoring the growls from her stomach. She set her hand on the small bump beneath her navel, fingers tracing the naked skin as another rumble scratched through her stomach. She shut her eyes and breathed deeply, thinking on the night sky and the constellations, picturing their stars brighter than ever in life, watching them dance behind her lids and sing sweet and high. But the singing 
turned to laughter. High, sweet children's laughter that pulled her smile into a frown and opened her eyes. Her stomach growled. She rolled her eyes with a sigh and slid out from beneath the covers, grabbing a robe as she slipped past the bedroom door and tiptoed downstairs to the kitchen to heat some water. She leaned against the counter, eyes half-lidded as the electric kettle came to a simmer and clicked off. She bounced lightly, eyes drifting through the dark kitchen over the island that separated her from the open dining room. The archway leading to the stairs yawned as she passed it over for the fridge, chrome gleaming and promising her something to shut up her stomach. She, she sighed at another growl, turning to pour the hot water over the bag of chamomile and clutching the blue earthenware mug between her cold fingers. She closed her eyes and leaned forward, breathing in the smell of the vapor as her stomach roared at her. She stared at the wall before facing the fridge, fingers laced on the handle and the door coming open, flooding the room with sterile light. She stood there, eyeing the contents and biting her lip, but nothing satisfied. She rifled through the shelves, the drawers, the doors, groaning as she pulled open the drawers again. The meat and cheese drawer yawned at her, and the smell wafted up like an angel. Her mouth watered as she picked up a leftover hamburger patty and peeled the plastic bag away, closing her eyes as she breathed deep and stood straight, closing the drawer and fridge without noticing. She flitted her eyes open to look at the clock, 3.20, and back to the charred meat. She swallowed, shrugged, and ate, not stopping until the patty was gone. She licked her fingers clean, her stomach finally quiet, and sighed as she headed for the front door, opening it with a squeak and sitting on the red bench between the door and the front window. She leaned back and breathed in the fresh morning air as the black sky faded to sapphire and the stars slowly sank beneath the earth. She smiled, one hand stroking her stomach absently as she looked for the constellations through the mounting light. She could name them thanks to her grandmother, but the sapphire became lighter and lighter. The clouds bloomed like flowers with hints of yellow, pink, and orange. The gray world slowly came alive with colors other than streetlight orange and bleach white. Grass and leaves became springing green. The houses a rainbow of red brick, white wood, and beige blue or green stucco. The concrete an old gray, the asphalt like gunpowder. She smiled and stood leaning against the white wooden banister as the streetlights flicked off one by one, staring after the first rays of the waking sun. Orange, white, and yellow shone like a distant campfire, singing the backs of her eyes and quieting her insides. A tension eased, a coil unraveled, a knot undone. She took a deep breath and waited for the first warm light to land on her skin, but a pale trail in the grass stuck out like blood in snow. She looked by the house, and her contended smile became a frown, nose wrinkling before the wind hit her back and stung her nostrils. She twisted her face and turned, covering her mouth to look at the other side of the porch. The composter, she thought, before going inside and getting a flashlight. She left the back door open behind her as she scaled down the steps to the lawn and around the corner yellow light beaming as she looked around the gray barrel, hand covering her mouth and nose. She peeked around the sides, leaning over it to look behind, kneeling to see a blood smear or a corpse rat. But there was nothing. She stood and opened the lid of the tumbler, but the only thing staring back was rotting vegetables and the promise of fertilizer beneath. She slammed the lid down and looked up to the sky as the last of the stars faded into the deep blue and fiery eastern faces of the clouds. She strolled back inside and locked the doors, reheating her cup of tea in the microwave before tiptoeing upstairs. The bedroom door stayed open as she pulled the robe around her feet before climbing into bed. She sat cross-legged, facing the window, steaming mug of tea clutched between her fingers as the rays of the sun crested and blazed the world with color. The last of the bats flitted away to their daytime nests as the birds picked up their shifts, flitting between trees and screaming new life into the air. High, sweet songs and chimes, silhouettes against an oil spill of morning sky. Even the raptors crested above. And below, the people roused. Light flicked on or off, 
Doors opened, headlights came on with the rev of engines and the press of tire to road. Sarah sipped her tea and smiled. A cool touch wound up her back and she jumped, turning to see Joseph smiling mischievously, trailing his fingers up her bare spine like walking legs as he rolled onto his stomach and crawled to lay by her thigh, kissing it lightly. Good morning, love. Good morning, handsome. She leaned down and kissed his lips, smiling as they pulled away and pecking his cheek before sitting upright again. How long have you been up? Just a little while. I got to see first light. Lucky. You didn't have to sleep in on your day off. No, you're right. He smirked, laying his head on her knee and stroking her thigh. I could have gotten up at three like always. Exactly. She smirked and ruffled his hair. So long as I can wake up and see you, it doesn't matter. He gave a dopey, drunk smile and shifted to sit next to her, yawning as his legs flopped over the edge of the bed. That's the cheesiest thing I think you've ever said. <laughs> it's called romance, babe. Look it up. He smiled and kissed her cheek. Besides, you're going to have a rough day, so I figured I could at least give you one or two smiles before the war starts. Her stomach dropped and crawled away with a sigh, eyes drifting into her cup as she answered, Thanks, babe. You sure you don't want me to come with you? She nodded. It's just lunch. I can handle your mom for a few hours. It's not like she's going to be in our house. She'd just ruin your day. Well, she's going to ruin yours. That doesn't mean we both have to suffer. Just have a stiff drink for me and give me a massage when I get home. He smiled and kissed her neck, saying, I can do that any time, as his hand slid onto her knee and up her stomach, stroking as he stared. It's still hard to believe sometimes, like I'll wake up and it'll all have been a dream. She laid her hand atop his, warm from the mug, and kissed his lips with a smile. Trust me, it's quite real, darling. You put a baby in there. Oh, I remember. I was there. Were you? You know, come to think of it, it might have been someone else. Did we get our schedules mixed up? Maybe. She furrowed her brows in mock thought. Because I remember the guy being a lot more handsome. And the girl I was with was devilishly gorgeous. They stared wordlessly and gave a shrug, Joseph saying, These things happen. We'll get it right the next time. Indeed. Sarah nodded firmly with a smile before she held out her mug. Now, hold this. Pregnant lady has to pee. She got up and sprinted to the bathroom, leaning on the doorway to look at her husband's defined back and smiled. But keep that sexy behind right there. I want something nice to look at when I get back. His shoulders jumped with a chuckle as he gave her a thumbs up, still looking out the window as he said, Go pee, woman. You're making me have to go just thinking about it. When she finished and came to the doorway, she found Joseph with his back to her, naked and pulling on a pair of jeans. His arms flexed as he slid the last of the denim onto his hips, flesh filling them out as her eyes drifted over him. She followed his back to his shoulders and more, leaning on the doorway and crossing her arms as he turned to find her watching. He cleared his throat as she settled onto his chest, hands on his hips and jeans not buttoned. Excuse me, miss. My eyes are up here. Oh, I know exactly where your eyes are. And where everything else is. She found his gaze and smirked. Why else do you think I'm gawking? He crossed the distance with a smile and kissed her, pulling her body against his. She breathed him in, chuckling at his chilly fingers before he broke away and asked low, Breakfast before brunch? You can if you're not coming. She looked at his mouth and bit her lip, fingers tracing up his thighs to the waistband. You don't have to come. Now what kind of husband would I be if I did that? He smirked, kissing across her cheek to her neck and whispering in her ear, You're not hungry? His hands wandered across her flesh as he kissed down to her shoulder. She shook her head, looking over his muscled back as he leaned down to pull her close. Ate earlier. Just distract me. She tugged on his waistband and he smiled wide with a gravelly chuckle, pulling her into the bedroom against the wall as his lips explored. So, oranges. Sarah nodded as she peeled the rind, 
holding her fingers beneath her nose and breathing deep, eyes fluttering on the sweet citrus that filled her. Oranges are amazing, a true gift from God. Is that all you crave, my sweet Sarah, my love? Joseph smirked before turning back around to the cold sausages on the counter. Meat, I know. Anything else? Not really, apart from peanut butter. Joseph turned with a small white plate. Three large sausages splayed over one another as he smiled and raised eyebrows, setting it next to her. She grinned in the bar stool, hoisting herself up to kiss him before turning to the plate. She picked up one with her fingers and crunched past the skin to the savory, salty heaven within. Her eyes rolled back as she chewed, open-mouthed and humming her pleasure. Should I be jealous? She opened her eyes and grinned, embarrassed, taking another bite before looking between him and the food. No, the sausage has nothing on you, babe. You're much prettier. Well, that's a relief. He crossed his arms over his chest, smirking with a tilt of his head. Trust me, the sausage isn't that good. She took another bite and hummed at the wave of flavor. You sure you don't want me to leave you two alone? I mean... I know anything with a hoof will do, but I'm really not into throuples, honey. Shut up, you gorgeous idiot. She swallowed and smiled wide, crossing the distance and planting a wet, greasy kiss on his cheek. He squirmed and laughed, rolling his eyes as she pulled away and licked her fingers clean. Yep, she said. You're definitely better than breakfast. Thanks. He reached around and pulled the sausage to his lips biting it in half and chewing dramatically before he sighed and shut his eyes. These are really good, though. I don't know, babe. It might be better than me. She rolled her eyes and returned to her seat as Joseph asked, So, what were you doing up so early? Dreams. The one with the baby in the tunnels? She shook her head. Haven't had that one in a while. Probably will now, though, thanks. I think it was my cravings. I had a dead bird this time. Nice. Bones and all, or... Everything but, actually. And a ton of ants. I swear, I've eaten more in my sleep than I do when I'm awake. Birds, squirrels, bugs, and worms on the menu. Every night. I even chased and ate a rabbit once. That was... a messy one. She found his eyes and couldn't read his face. What do you think it means? I think you had it right the first time. Cravings. Maybe a little symbolism, too. I mean, why am I eating corpses, though? And at night, what does that mean? She sighed as Joseph shrugged. Birds could mean aspirations. Maybe I'm afraid I'll destroy my hopes and dreams? But squirrels and rabbits are just pure prey, fear personified. Why am I eating them? It's not like I'm going through a metamorphosis. And the bugs and worms. Nasty things are always in the dirt, so maybe they're, what, secrets I have to uncover or something? She looked up. Another question on her lips as she stopped to stare at Joseph's grinning face, hand propping him up on the counter and accentuating his defined shoulders. What? Nothing. I just love watching your mind work. It's like puzzle pieces are moving on their own. Anyone can think things through, babe. She picked up another sausage and filled her jaws. Yeah, but hardly anyone does. I married the humble genius. He crossed the distance and kissed her forehead before putting the rest of the leftover sausages back in the fridge. By the way, she said, picking up the orange and popping a slice into her mouth. The composter. Something stinks really bad, but I can't see anything. He nodded, talking around the last of his breakfast. I'll take a look when we get home. What's it smell like? Like death. I think a rat crawled in or something. It... It's way worse than rotting peels. Trust me. Potatoes? The last time was... rough. She smirked and shook her head. I'll never forget that nastiness, and that wasn't it. You're right. Probably a rat. Speaking of... Your mother... Sarah sighed and shoved the rest of the breakfast into her mouth. But our morning was going so well... We're going to see her soon, so I figured we could harden our skin before the battle. He smiled knowingly, inclining his head. You don't have to come if you don't want to. I'm not making you. Her chest tightened at the thought of his face screwing up with resentment. I know you're not. 
I want to go. I want to be with you. I'm not going to leave you alone with her unless I have to. She's a vampire. Just think of me as your extra blood. If you insist... I do. Then we should get ready. It's almost nine. They both stood, but before walking upstairs, she caught his hand. He spun to face her, dark eyes looking down from the bottom step. Thank you. He smiled and kissed her gently, spinning with her hand in his and leading her back upstairs. Twenty minutes later and with a turn of the front door lock, Sarah and Joseph jumped into their car and pulled onto the near-empty road. Comfortable silence settled on the air as they went, a light mist that nested on their skin and in their clothes and let Sarah's mind wander. The trees from between the houses blurred into the night forest of her dreams, even as they faded on the edge of town. The smell of the darkness tickled her nose like dew. The memory of churned earth hung around her, the taste of blood and flesh and feathers trickled down her throat. She swallowed, shifting in her seat and toying with her purse. Her eyes flitted between the buildings, avoiding the yawning doorways as people busied themselves on the sidewalk and birds that burst into the air with an explosion of wings. She leaned into the glass to watch their silhouettes move as one crossed the pale sky before they stopped in a light. She looked ahead, fingers lax again on her purse as the tension left her shoulders and her knees stopped kneading together. The old church sat atop Laying Hill on the northern edge of town, a great gray thing with stained-glass windows that caught the morning sunlight, like frozen fire and molten gems. They were too far away to see, but angels and saints stood like sentinels in the glass, and the largest one at the back, overlooking the sanctuary, had the risen Jesus ascending to heaven with his bleeding wounds above the hill of Golgotha. They each danced and sparkled in the back of her mind, the choir full and beautiful, the inside gilded and polished like a mirror, the wooden pews dark and red against the white stone interior. Maybe we should stop by the church after this, Sarah thought. Father Nathaniel could translate the Latin on that coin. Something screamed above the choir in her head, something high and terrible and desperate, worse than an animal too mindless to be human. Sarah sat back as the clergy all stripped away their robes and stood naked and whipped, their backs bleeding onto the floor as the choir's voices stopped, though each member mouthed the words in a dead song. The men of the church all lifted their voices in Latin, but it wasn't a scripture or any prayer that she remembered as a girl. Requiem nostram in venimus in te, they said in unison. Regina nostra quies sub monte. They fell to their knees, smiling in relief before the congregation, silent and dazed, and uplifted their hands, weeping and laughing and crying and sobbing. They fell to their faces, screaming the Latin desperately again and again as a man and woman walked from the doors either side the choir. Their robes trained the ground like brides, beautiful and warm in red, yellow, green, and orange, that stood out like fire in the night, their pale and golden hair and alabaster skin blending into the white stone of the church. They stood behind the father, the woman lifting a flail and bringing it down across his back under the watchful eye of the ascending Christ in the window behind. The priest reeled and screamed as she whipped him, tearing his skin free and splattering the air with a bloody mist. Her face was painted in a gentle smile, like her child had done something so perfectly silly. The man was unreadable. Their gem eyes emerald and blue topaz, fell on Sarah as small, pale hands crept out of their robes. Sarah blinked as a crow screamed on the power line nearby. The car moved. She swallowed as Latin still rang in her head. Did I know that much as a girl? She looked at Joseph, the coin gleaming behind her eyes with the shining woman and the words encircling her opposite face. Babe? He hummed in response. Can we swing by the church after brunch? 
I want to let Father Nathaniel look at the Latin from that coin. You sure you'll be up for it? She nodded. I thought you already translated it. Something about a queen under a mountain and knowledge and light. She chuckled. Google's many things, but the perfect translator, it is not. Besides, it comes off as way too Gnostic for satanic priests. Maybe they were Luciferians. Speaking of satanic priests, the coin, did you ever sell it? I listed it on a couple sites, he said, turning down another street and taking the church out of view. There were a few inquiries, but nothing we'd be interested in. Until a couple days ago. I was going to wait till I knew for sure, but there's this guy, a collector, who's willing to pay double what we listed. I told him we had others already asking, and he upped it again. Where is he? In town? He shook his head. But he's in state. He's got a place in New York, some rich guy into occult stuff, I guess. So long as he gets it out of the house, I don't care what he buys it for. Hey, thanks to this wacko, we might be set up more than ten grand. We could use that money for the baby pretty soon. Cribs, toys, diapers, ain't cheap. His eyes flicked to her and back to the road. I know, it just creeps me out. The whole satanic priests and dead babies thing. Yeah, yeah, I know, the babies were the plague. I don't care. It still creeps me out. It's too much, it's too much, like... She sighed. Joseph chuckled, taking her hand and squeezing gently. My love, if you can't even handle demon priests... How will you defeat this dragon? She looked through the windshield to the restaurant, Quentin's balcony, and her mother sitting in the waiting room area through the building's glass face. She was the same height as Sarah, same color hair, same shoulders, and beneath it all, were they the same? Or something different? Sarah laughed nervously as they pulled into the parking lot, sighing with a cartoonish frown. You're right. Give me Satanist priest and a haunted coin any day. Their mother turned and spotted them as they parked, smiling wide around perfectly spaced, bleach-white teeth. She waved and stood, making for the door. Sarah took a deep breath and grabbed the door handle, looking at Joseph and pulling him in for a short kiss. In case one of us doesn't make it. He opened his door, pushing his mouth into a smile with his fingers and whispering, My heart will go on before launching to his feet and greeting Sarah's mother. Mama G! He hugged her tight and held her as Sarah got out and shut her door, taking a few more breaths before making her way over with the wind at her back, carrying something warm and alien with it. Hi, Mom, she said around a fake smile. Joseph let go of the woman, letting her turn and hug Sarah, grabbing her skull to kiss her cheek. You've put on a little weight, haven't you? her mother said, backing away and drinking her in. I mean because of the baby. Sarah forced a wider smile and patted her stomach. It's only a couple months old, Mom. I haven't put on that much. Oh, it's not a bad thing. Her mother waved at it dismissively before taking her daughter's arm and leading her by the elbow. I hope you don't mind, but I'm famished. She leaned closer to Sarah, her large curls blowing around her head as she whispered. I already took my pills, so I need to eat. Shouldn't you take them earlier in the day? Sarah asked as Joseph opened the door. Aw, thank you, son. And they say chivalry's dead. She turned back to Sarah as she let go of her arm and approached the receptionist. The rest of my party's here. Very good, ma'am, the young man said with a curt smile, eyes flitting to Sarah and Joseph as they laced arms. Three? He turned to a nearby waiter and set them up, saying pleasantries as they left him. Anyway, her mother stopped and laced her arm in Sarah's other, speeding them along to their table by the window, looking into the parking lot. I'm supposed to take them with food, and I didn't eat this morning because I wanted to save room for now, so I just pushed them back a couple hours. It'll be fine. I do it all the time. You're not supposed to do that, Mom. It could mess up your dose. Her mother waved it away as they'd separated at the table, smiling wide with a pleased sigh and taking her seat, ordering a mimosa before Sarah stopped her. Oh, right. Medicine. Just an orange juice, then. She smiled flirtatiously at their young waiter, and he smiled wide, leaving his eyes dead and distant. Can't blame him, Sarah thought. Anyway, enough about me. 
her mother said, folding her hands under her newly tightened jowl. It'll be about you again in no time. Don't worry. Well, I'm pregnant, she added aloud. They all forced laughs around the table, Joseph setting his hand on Sarah's knee as her mother piped up. Well, how's that going? Any weird cravings yet? Bad dreams? I mostly think about meat all day, Sarah said, fighting the urge to furrow her brow as her mother made a face she hadn't seen in a long time. Her blue eyes went dark as something alien swam behind them, darting about like a dog on fire. And oranges, Joseph added as their drinks came. Sarah chuckled with a slight flick of her eyes. Yes, and oranges. And I've had a few bad dreams. What about? Her mother leaned on the table with her elbows out wide. Flashes of dead animals and catacombs rushed in Sarah's mind. Just weird stuff. Sarah forced a scrunched up smile and sat back in her chair, hand finding Joseph's and squeezing gratefully as he stroked her skin. Like what? her mother asked. Because I dreamt everything from digging holes for worms to orgies with another woman and her husband. Sarah blinked and sat up. Mom, shut up. We're in public. Oh, don't be so bashful. She flicked her eyes between Sarah and Joseph. I'm sure you two have done a thing or two. Caves and skeletons, Sarah blurted out, slapping her mother's pale gaze on hers in a second. What? That's what's in my nightmares. Stone caves and bones and babies. Sarah squeezed Joseph's hand tighter, neither looking at the other. But the rest are just weird, like I'm outside or something. Her mother stared at her, mouth frozen between a smile and frown as her eyes twinkled like she had a fever. She brushed her hair out of her face with a lick of the lips as she sipped her juice and sat back. Have you been seeing anything weird while you're awake? No, Joseph answered. Why would she? Pregnancy brain, honey. Her mother smiled curtly at him before going back to Sarah. Men, think they know it all, eh? He's right. I'm not hallucinating, Mom. She swallowed, eyes still boring into her mother's as she thought. I'm not you. I'm not the crazy one. The waiter returned to Sarah's relief, hands clasped behind his back as he asked if they were ready to order. I'm sorry, dear, her mother said smiling at him as she brushed her hair to the side and squeezed her arms together just enough to push her breasts out. But we've been so preoccupied with catching up we haven't even looked at the menus. That's all right, he said, smile not reaching his dead brown eyes. I'll give you a few more minutes and bring you some waters. Thank you, Joseph said with a nod of the head. What are you thinking, babe? Sarah looked at the menu, ignoring her mother's eyes flicking up and down at her. She opened her mouth to speak, but her mother beat her to it. I have no idea what I want. Sarah bit her cheek before opening her mouth. Her mother blurted out. I mean, it all just looks so good. And I'm so hungry. Couple ham steaks with eggs. And a strawberry milkshake. Sarah turned to Joseph and found his black eyes and the grin beneath that made his face come alive. She smiled. You know, I think they let you order lunch or dinner here, too. Her mother flipped the menu over and continued like they hadn't spoken. You could just order a steak if you're craving red meat. Nah, I'm feeling like some pig. What about you, babe? She pressed her knee against his, the denim sliding together. Suit yourself, her mother said, returning to the menu. An omelette. That sounds perfect. The vegetable for me. Trying to watch my girlish figure. She slid her hands down her sides with a serious smile. A figure you haven't had since Neil was born. Sarah thought and squeezed Joseph's hand tight, forcing herself to smile. Meat lovers for you, hon? Joseph grinned with a nod, running his free hand over his side and staring right into her mother's eyes. I'm watching my figure, too. Sarah's mother reached across the table and took her free hand, forcing their eyes together. You can talk to me about anything. You know that, right? I mean... It's your first pregnancy, and I have a little experience with these things. I know, Mom. Sarah slid her hand back with a rigid grin, trying to soften her eyes and keep her nose from crinkling. Her mother stared at her for a moment. Then her pale eyes glazed over and she sat up, reanimated. Meat lovers, huh? 
What is it with men and meat? Keep some lean, Mom. And I like my men like I like my meat. She found Joseph's eyes and blew him a cartoonish kiss. Lean. I swear the two of you were made for each other, her mother whispered to herself. You're practically twins. I'm surprised you don't drive each other crazy. Guess that's what happens when you're actually capable of love, Sarah thought, but just chuckled. Two hours later, Sarah and Joseph fell into the seats of the car and shut the doors with a long sigh. Sarah's eyes sat heavy, mind ready for bed despite it barely being midday, her limbs sinking around her and almost numb. She took a deep breath, letting the silence settle inside her, like wind blowing away the dust and damp. Joseph took her hand. She lulled her head to the driver's seat and found him staring, his dark eyes darker, yet his lips twinkling in a grin. Another brush with death. We narrowly missed the scythe this time, she chuckled, squeezing his hand. Thank you for coming. I don't know if I'd have made it on my own this time. No, probably not. Or you would have killed her. He brought her hand to his lips and held it there in a tired kiss, breathing her in and letting her go on the exhale. I couldn't bear the thought of you in prison, or us trying to get rid of the body. Nasty business, murder. It's always so inconvenient the bodies don't just disappear, isn't it? You know, it is. It's just rude. They chuckled to themselves as Joseph started the car and pulled onto the road. All right, so... to the church? Sarah's body groaned, her mind collapsing inside her skull. I think I just want to go home and put my feet up for my lovely husband to rub. Lucky you have such a good husband. Really is. She shut her eyes and laid back. Wish I had one. Good men are just so hard to come by. I'm telling you. She gestured in front of her blindly. I mean, you can hardly even convince a guy to buy a hundred-year-old possibly cursed coin from satanic priests. Joseph tisked and turned the car around, slowly taking them home. Tuesday, July 7th. Night air swam past her face, branches flinging around her, grabbing and scratching as she bounded between the trees. The light behind her dwindled as she ran, swallowed by the woods and leaves until she was surrounded by darkness. She stopped. Crickets and night things went still and quiet, thickening the air with a deadly silence only broken by the rustling leaves overhead. The chill grabbed her naked body, but she couldn't tremble, only scent the air. Her unblinking eyes stared into the dark, ears perked like a fox as she breathed deep. Damp leaves and earth, wood, the musk of unimportant prey, something silvery and bitter on the wind. She stiffened as something else found her nose, musky and wet, like a dog but not as familiar. Rustling came from her left, then shuffling dirt and leaves, and a cooing purr. She spun and launched. Dirt sprang behind her with each step deeper into the dark. She wove between the trees, rounded a trunk, and leapt through the air, landing crouched ten feet from a nest. A flock of turkeys stirred and lifted their necks, each calling to wake the others as Sarah ran on all fours, growling as she pounced. A fat turkey stretched forward, flopping to its feet and darting away. She landed and rolled, head level with the ground and her body following suit as she scuttled on all fours after the nearby hen. She rose onto her hind legs, mouth open and hands curled into claws as she fell onto the creature and rolled. She grabbed its neck beneath the skull and its bones cracked and snapped under her. She closed her body around the clawing, screaming thing and tumbled. Sarah pulled the neck taut and reared back, her mouth stretching too far open and closing like a viper on the hen's throat. Hot copper flooded her mouth beside sticky feathers. She swallowed, eyes unwavering, face slack as she tightened her bite and tore back, ripping the creature's throat. The splatter of blood rained black in the moonlight, hitting the ground with pulsing spurts of warm, delicious crimson spoils. Sarah licked her lips as she shoved the turkey onto the ground, its legs still kicking even as the last of its life slipped from its eyes. She pushed the legs either side of the bird until the hips broke and set her right fingertips to its gut, piercing the skin and prying its abdomen open. Steam rose in the silent night 
as Sarah delved into its innards, throwing away the intestines before latching onto the kidneys and shoveling them into her mouth. She licked her fingers clean, chewing so fast that she nearly bit them. Something deep inside her sighed with relief like a satisfied lover. She swallowed and realized how empty her stomach was, though. The relief was thrown aside, and hunger grabbed her stomach and clawed it open. More, she thought, and reached back inside for the liver, slurping it down and panting around her food. Her eyes, weeping for want to blink, stared at the ground, body moving on memory as she reached into the chest and ripped the heart free. Her expressionless face stretched as she opened her mouth to take half the organ in at once and bit down, rearing up on her knees to catch the blood in the chambers and swallowing it. She chewed the tough muscle, head back as warmth dribbled down her face, down her chest, staining her hands and filling her stomach. The stars twinkled briefly between the trees as the wind swam through them, moonlight bleeding down as she stuffed the other half of the heart into her mouth and gnawed. Her jaws ached as she ate, but she chewed, swallowing bit by bit until all that was left were the lungs. She leaned over the husk of the animal and felt for her stomach. It was so full, yet so empty. Her fingers sprawled over her naked belly, drying blood sticking to her skin as something inside met her hand. She stared into the empty corpse, tears slowly, steadily falling down her cheeks and tilted her head like a curious cat. She gripped the edge of the skin and tore, peeling it back to expose the muscle as she laid her face to the meat, teeth sinking deep and tearing away strand after chewy strand with wet snaps until her stomach was bloated. She swallowed the last and sat back on her heels, eyes settling in the darkness as it shifted around the trees, almost taking form. A man? A woman? A child? Whatever it was, it knew her name. It opened its hand to her, waving her closer as it whispered wordless promises. It opened its mouth and the wind blew, dancing in the branches and forming words that no human ear could understand. But the eyes? They were clear. There was no shine or glitter, just as there was no man or woman standing in the darkness. It was the whisper of the memory of a shadow, a vision that she could see and knew wasn't there all at once. But the eyes of the darkness were bright and pale like white gold and silver and starlight, and sharp as razors. They didn't watch her tonight. They called. Come, they seemed to say. Follow me. This way, Sarah. This way. She rose and stumbled forward on numb legs until pins and needles faded to feeling and cold with each step pushing the shadow back into the darkness. It reached out and beckoned her, eyes speaking louder than any voice, yet still unheard. One mile became two, became ten. Thirty minutes became an hour, became four. Then the shadow was swallowed by moonlight in a clearing that shouldn't be there. Sarah walked past the tree line, the moonlight stinging her eyes as she came closer to the base of a crumbling stony hill and stopped to drink it in. Gray rock sprinkled by gray grass, all flowing into the jagged black mouth of a cave. And there the shadow stood, as unseen and unreal as before, yet still beckoning her all the same. She walked through the clearing to the uneven base of the mound and clambered up the destroyed and long-forgotten steps like a ladder until the cave yawned around her. She pulled herself up, crawling into the darkness until she could stand and face the endless hall of carved stone. She turned back to look at the moonlight, but the world was gone, having become just more tunnel, going up and up. She followed the floor, finding steps in the distance before becoming steep and flat and breaking into steps again near her feet. She faced the darkness, and there was no shadow, yet something pulled her down. She took her first step, then another, and on and on, somehow able to see, 
despite there being no torches or lights. She stopped before the final step where the floor became smooth and steep again and looked into the black before flinging out her foot and landing on the ground. The darkness vanished like someone cut a new strip of film with the last, the world blinking somewhere else, taking her into the gray stone room lit by green torches. She turned around, finding the giant double doors shut at the back of the stained glass window. The darkness vanished like someone had cut a new strip of film with the last, the world blinking somewhere else, taking her into the gray stone hall lit by green torches. She turned around, finding the giant double doors shut at the back, and the stained glass window opposite above the stage. It was still void of dressing apart from the candelabras, and the air was still and stale. Something screamed from the doors either side of the stage, high and shrill and desperate. Sarah lurched forward, heart pulled after it without a second thought as a second scream leapt through the air, and a third, and fourth. Sarah bounded down the left doorway, panting hard as the screamer's mouth tried to form words, muddling their cry and deepening as she wove through the tunnels, bones slowly overtaking the walls. Mama! The voice cried between gasping breaths. Mama! M Mama! Mama, please! She ran harder, feet aching, skin splitting on the hard stone, heart pounding painfully as her blood roared in her ears. Mama! The scream came closer as she turned a corner, and another, and another. Where are you, baby? Tears ran down her face as it twisted, mouth an ugly frown as she gasped for breath, ignoring the skulls watching from empty sockets, the wet stink of moldy mortar and old water puddling on the stone floor. Mama! 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 It tore through her like she'd watched her baby get eaten alive. She bounded forward, toes catching on the floor and slicing open, but she didn't stop. She couldn't stop. The screams were closer, louder. The baby was right there. She reached forward as she came to another fork in the tunnels. I'm here! She panted, chest burning like her heart would fail. She grabbed the corner of the wall and leapt around, warm light filling her eyes, stinging her sockets as she fumbled forward, mumbling for her baby, slurring her words until she kicked something hard. She gasped, eyes flinging open and burning at the sight of sunrise. Her hands were outstretched and tapping her bedroom window. She spun, eyes squeezed shut and hobbling for the edge of her own bed. She sat and hissed blinking the sting from her eyes as she checked her toes, bruised but fine, and spun around, drinking in the sight of her bedroom and the empty bed. She sighed, setting her hand on her forehead as her heart pounded in her ears. The, the scream echoed as the watchful, empty sockets of the catacombs rushed by, swallowing her in the darkness. She opened her damp eyes, chest twisting as she covered her mouth and swallowed a shaky breath. Her veins burned, muscles tight and aching to run after the screaming baby. Everything in her said to go mad and tear the room apart until she found it, but she sat there, letting the warm light of the cresting sun wash the dark and damp from her skin and her eyes and her heart. Slowly the shrill cry quieted and laid down to sleep with the image of a peaceful babe, warm, wrapped, and clean in its crib. She took a deep breath, wiping away the tears as the twitching ache in her chest turned to steel, and she set her hand on her stomach. She stroked the skin, reminding herself that her baby was there, not in her dreams. She smiled as something shifted inside, so small and gentle, but there nonetheless. She chuckled. Your daddy would love the thought of you moving already. She looked down with a wide grin, and then to her nightstand and the yellow note there, reaching for it as she continued. Says you're going to be a fighter. Or a dancer. She unfolded the paper and grinned at Joseph's handwriting. Go downstairs and see your surprise. Love, Jojo. She grinned and stood setting the note down as she headed for the bathroom 
and then the stairs, hands on her stomach as she descended and chuckling as something moved again. Joe's going to go crazy over you, she thought, and added aloud. More than he already has. She reached the banister and headed into the kitchen, where a crimson rose sat open in the morning sun, gleaming hot and bright like a distant star beside the box of her favorite tea and a kettle of water. She crossed the distance and picked up the little yellow note, following Joseph's cursive hand scrawling a short, sweet poem above a messier line. P.S. Thought you'd like to hear the buyer finally bought the pendant. We're a little richer and that much more ready for the baby. Love you. XO, XO. She smiled wide and laughed, kissing the note and letting her arms fall limp as her head craned back with a glad sigh. Thank God. She looked down at her stomach and rubbed her hand over the tank top, whispering, We just might make it, little one. She kissed her fingers and set them on her belly with a hum before turning on the electric kettle and readying her tea, bobbing the bag as she looked over her garden. She took her mug by the handle and stepped onto the back porch, grinning as the dew sparkled like orange and pink gems in the firelight of the rising sun. She breathed in the scent of her tea and exhaled loudly as she looked at the sky. But when she breathed in again, something foul slapped across her face. She turned to the corner of the house where the composter would be and held her tea closer to her nose, ignoring the tickle of the steam and twisting her mouth in disgust. He checked it and there was nothing, she thought. Nothing dead inside or behind or under or behind something else. She looked at the steps and rounded the corner to the composter, setting the tea on the concrete walkway connecting the front and backyards. She crouched and looked under it again, hand over her mouth and nose as she peered behind it and huffed. She knelt in front of it and flung the lid open, swallowing down the bile as the stench wove between her fingers. It settled on her tongue, rancid, jerking a gag from her throat as she turned away, her stomach twisting as images of rotten, maggot-infested meat flashed behind her eyes. She swallowed and held her breath, turning back to the composter and reaching inside, overturning the wilted material on top. She dug deeper to the slime and rot, still nothing as she fished around the cylinder. Deeper still, and still nothing. She hissed a sigh and stood, letting the lid drop down with its own weight and pulling her loose hair back with a clean hand before she scooped up her tea and froze. White and yellow mushroom heads peeked between the grass, following the outline of the house. She stood, face twisted in sharp angles as her fingers squeezed the cup and stalked back to the steps to the kitchen. She abandoned her tea to heft out four large bags of Epsom salt from the laundry room to the back porch. She carried the fourth to the mushrooms and tore it open, tipping it over to cover them just enough to fall between their stalks without mounding the lawn. No sense in wasting the salt, she thought. She trailed the bag around the corner to the composter, ignoring the screams of a nearby crow. Her heel caught her pajama pants and she cursed, setting the bag of salts down to tie the base into knots, cursing to herself and making noises just to move hot air before she hefted the bag up and set back to work. She made it past the front corner before the bag was empty and stood, resting before she stomped back for another bag, tossing the empty one away and dragging the second to the front yard. The crow squawked and cawed angrily, like another bird had dared to land on its tree, but she didn't look up, only sputtering curses onto the mushrooms alongside the salt, dragging it around the house to the other front corner before the bag was empty. She stood straight, stretching her back and wiping away the dew from her brow as a crow flapped overhead, squawking and screaming as it landed outside the salt. It looked at her and twisted its head, ruffling its feathers with a loud cry before it flapped its wings, hopping. What do you want? Sarah growled, stepping closer with her fists bowled. The bird cawed and stood taller, opening its wings and flapping furiously. She scoffed and walked back around the house, tossing the empty bag aside for a new one. Just enough to have one left over. Joe's gonna kill me. But I can't stop now. She drugged the bag down the steps and tore it open, starting a new line from the backyard to the porch. She dumped the salt too heavy in the first pour and cursed herself, growling as she moved on in a horse stance, waddling around 
and ignoring the screaming crow that circled the house, gliding into the grass near the fence. It squawked and hopped. Feathers ruffled around its throat like Sarah was stomping on its eggs and burning its nest. Shut it, she barked, but its beak jolted open in a loud scream, with wings raised as she went to round the back corner. It launched at her, jamming its beak into her shoulder. She yelled, the bag of salts falling and spilling into the grass as she spun, arm flying through the air. Her fist caught it in the chest, arm like cords of metal. It choked a scream and tumbled through the air, wings flapping like flags, body spinning as it arched to the ground. She cradled her shoulder, a small trickle of blood falling down her arm. She hissed and watched the crow, face twisted and mouth an ugly, crooked frown. The bird twitched and rolled onto its belly, shaking its head and getting to its feet as Sarah spat on the ground before it. It ignored her and stretched its wings letting out a weak noise as Sarah kicked the loose salt on the ground over the mushrooms and picked the bag up to finish her work, eyes flicking to the crow as she went. It stayed there, testing its wings and stumbling to its feet as she rounded the front corner. She sighed as she went, shaking her head and mumbling how it shouldn't have tried to hurt her. But when the bird screamed louder than before, Sarah still jumped and stood straight, looking around. There was no flap of wings, or a second call. Great, she whispered to herself. I must have killed it. One more grave to dig. Then she stooped over the last stretch of mushrooms right of the front steps, and covered them with salt, setting the mostly empty bag on the concrete, and stepping back. She looked at the white and pink speckled trail of salt over the damnable trail of fungus and smirked, hands on her hips as she squinted at them like she'd just killed their whole family. Her shoulder twanged as she stretched her back. Hissing, she grabbed the small wound and sighed, shaking her head and sprinkling the blood onto the grass. I better not need a shot for that, you stupid rat. Hey, Sarah. She turned to the fence at her right and blinked against the morning sun. Maddie stood behind the small white fence. Her short black hair pulled back in a clip as a hundred flyaways tumbled at the edges. Her pale skin stood out against the dark green plaid robe that hugged tight around her waist. Morning, Matt. How's it going? Good, she chuckled nervously, gesturing to the Epsom salts. What kind of project you got going? Sarah turned to the near-empty bag and back to her friend with an embarrassed chuckle. Those mushrooms I told you about? Yeah, they came back with a vengeance. Maddie nodded with a wide smile as she leaned on the fence. You know that'll kill the soil, right? Sarah shrugged. I'm not growing anything there anyway. Reminds me, how's the garden? You haven't heard that thing rooting around, have you? Maddie tucked a strand of hair behind her ear, leaning with both elbows on the fence. What thing? You haven't heard it running around at night. Sarah shook her head. Well, it sounds big and it's been chasing stuff left and right. No, I haven't heard anything, but our bedroom is on the second floor. Maddie nodded. Yeah, well, us peasants on the first floor can hear that dog or whatever it is hunting something. Dog? Well, what else could it be? There aren't any bears or wolves or cats here. Not that I know of, anyway. I'll ask Joe to take a look in the woods if he isn't too tired later. You want to come over for breakfast? Maddie smiled and checked her phone, frowning comically with a teeter of her head. I don't have to take any calls until later. Besides, I want to clean that up, she pointed to Sarah's shoulder. Sarah chuckled, beckoning her inside as Maddie rounded the fence and came into the yard. Some crazy crow jumped me in the back. You don't think I have rabies now, do you? You gotta go in for a checkup soon, right? Maddie asked as they climbed the steps. Have the doc take a look. Now, she hooked her arm with Sarah. Give me the lowdown on pregnancy. What sucks, what's great, and do you hate your husband yet? They both chuckled as they passed the threshold. Then the wind burst. It sent their hair and clothes flapping in front of them. They ducked and turned, squinting at the force of it as the trees twisted and shook, leaves scattering everywhere. Sarah grabbed the door, pushing against it and staring at the little crow that flapped away into the sky before the door was locked 
and shut. Thursday, July 9th. Sarah woke with the screaming still in her ears. Mama! Mama, please! And the taste of frog and snake still on her tongue. She shut her eyes as it came back. Same as always, apart from what she ate. The night, the hunt, the feast. The shadow, the walk, the mound. The hall, the screams, the catacombs. And then the running, the running, always the running. She sat up, hand on her stomach as she breathed deeply and settled her heart, opening her eyes to take in her bedroom, cement herself in the real world, the waking world. Sunlight settled on her skin and wrapped her up the way Joseph did, his strong arms coming from behind and pulling their bodies together so that she could rest on his chest. The ghost of his kisses danced on her neck, and she smiled despite herself, fingers tracing the skin there. She slid her legs over the edge of the bed, drinking in the warm rays as she swallowed. Her mouth twisted at the memory of the taste of blood as she stood and went to the bathroom, pulling her lips and cheeks back to check for cuts. But there was nothing. She stepped back and looked at herself with a sigh. Mine's a powerful thing. After brushing her teeth, Glad to be rid of the taste, she pulled her hair back in a messy bun and headed downstairs in a gray tank top and bottoms, bare feet clapping on the hardwood as she went through the kitchen. She smiled at the kettle, already prepared with water and her favorite tea set beside, plucking up the little yellow note propped against the kettle. Joseph's quick cursive scratched across the paper. Babe, I forgot to put the pendant in the mail yesterday. Can you do it? Love you. Something pale moved at the edge of her vision. She set the note down looking through the kitchen window to the backyard, eyes combing the trees for something. But there were only live oaks, ashes, and sapling cedars. She set her jaw tight and powdered her lips, mocking herself wordlessly as she turned on the kettle and waited for it to boil. She leaned with her back on the counter, facing the kitchen as the water simmered, arms folded over her chest as she yawned. She looked at the floor and sighed at the dirt, racking up the list of chores for the day as her eyes fell to her feet. She furrowed her brows, arms slowly unwinding as she leaned down to look better at her toenails and the black dirt under each of them. She tilted her head, pulling it back as she fell into memory, sure her feet weren't dirty whenever she went to sleep last night. The dream flashed behind her eyes, the warmth of black soil on the cool night air, the hot blood in her mouth, the crunch of little bones jolting her jaw. Squawks exploded from behind her. She whipped around, eyes wide as she grabbed the counter and leaned forward to watch the blurring silhouettes of a group of blackbirds peel through the still air over her house. She watched for them, but they were gone, off to hunt more shiny things. What was a flock of crows called? She thought to herself and grinned as it lighted in her skull. A murder. A murder of crows. She stepped back. What was that old nursery rhyme? One for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy. Five for silver, six for gold, seven for a secret never to be told. She chuckled and rolled her eyes. Well, that's not true. One's brought me trouble and gold. She turned off the kettle before it came to a boil, pulling a mug from the cabinet and filling it near to the rim. Now, where do you put that coin pendant thing? She let her tea steep as she looked in the junk bowl by the back door moving through the kitchen until she found it in the middle of the island, beside a package to send it. She picked it up and looked it over, with tight lips, flipping the face to forego the shining woman to the Latin encircling the little hill on the back. She mouthed the words first before speaking them aloud. Requiem nostrum invenimus in te, regina nostra, quae est sub monte. She took a deep breath skin bristling in goosebumps as she stood straight and whispered the rest. Lux ex tenebris et scientia de lumine. She brushed her fingers over the letters and whispered, Our queen under the mountain, before flipping it back to the front and studying the smiling face of the shining woman, her crown ornate and as beautiful as she was meant to be. Why were Satan worshipping priests talking about a queen under a mountain? 
Could be an Auntie Mary thing. Queen of Heaven versus Queen Under the Mountain? She grinned. Under the Mountain. Who are you, Thor and Oakenshield? She looked at the clock and back to the pendant, clicking her tongue before setting it down and going back to her tea, throwing out the bag to blow on the steam. I think a visit to the church is in order today. I can even drop you off at the post office on the way, she thought, picking up the gold piece and dropping it in the small parcel. She sipped at her tea as she taped it shut and slipped it into her purse for later, quickly jotting down the words on a sticky note and fixing it to the package. Sarah stepped from her car in the large parking lot, grabbing the strap of her leather purse as she looked up the impossibly tall cathedral, spires reaching up to stab heaven and double doors huge and hungry and dark. She blinked, half expecting to hear a baby cry for her, but there was nothing but the wind atop laying hill to pull on her flowing white shirt and tumbling hair. She crossed the distance to the front steps, dozens to climb, sticking near the center guardrail as she watched the dark doors of the church. Reaching the top step, Sarah went for the right of the giant doors, where a smaller one was carved out on brass hinges, making the sign of the cross before entering. She bit her lip. Her gold cross was left somewhere at home, and her rosary had been buried years ago, forgotten and unneeded, but here in the church she'd been christened in, raised and taught in, she felt naked and dirty without them. She swallowed, pressing on with a false smile. Get this done and get out, she thought. Maybe God won't take offense if I'm quick. She flicked to the confessional and sighed inside herself, reaching through her memory and failing to find the last time she'd confessed, to God or man or herself. She hurried forward through the foyer, eyes flicking past the brilliant marble and gold, the polished wooden pews, the muted red cushions. Finally, she found someone and half sprinted to them. It was a young man, not a priest, she remembered, but she couldn't place the title that he should have. He was short, her height, with tidy blonde hair and eyes pale as her mother's. He smiled as she approached, clasping his hands in front as he faced her, black button-up a size too big, pants a size too small, crimson tie like blood in snow. "'Hello. Have I seen you before?' He had a kind face, something bright even in the shadow as he faced away from the glowing stained glass. She gave a nervous smile clutching her purse strap tighter with both hands and wringing it. Yeah, sorry, uh, been a while since I've come in. I was just looking for someone. All right. He held his smile and spread his slender hands. Who can I help you find, Miss... Sarah. She wiped her hand and held it out for him to take, shaking it as he did. I'm Sarah Bowen. He nodded and let his hand fall. Nice to meet you. I'm David. She forced a smile tucking her hair back as she pressed. Yeah, so I, I was looking for Father Nathaniel. I need to talk to him about something. Do you know if he's available? I think he said he'd be in his office. I can go ask if you like. That'd be great, thanks. With that, the young man was gone, and she was left alone in the beautiful terror of the belly of our mother of perpetual sorrows. She slowly turned in a half circle to look at each of the stained glass windows. Here with the disciples, there with Mary, another with Jesus, but the one opposite the double door was massive and round, with Jesus rising into the clouds amid a beam of light. His blood dripped like rubies in the white ray. She grinned to herself, remembering the time she told her mother it looked like he was getting beamed up by aliens. I couldn't sit for the whole next day. Her grin fell as her eyes did, sliding into the empty choir seats atop the stage, behind the speaking box. The doors either side the stage were tall and slender as if to accommodate skinny giants. Two rows of columns lined the center of the long hall leading from the front doors to the stage, flowing like flowers into the frescoes painted on vaulted ceilings. She swallowed as something cold breathed up her spine, like winter incarnate and unseen, a pale shadow just out of sight and watching her with sharp eyes. Sarah? She jumped at Father Nathaniel's rumbly tone, whirling around as she chuckled at herself. She smiled, heart sliding back into her chest. He opened his arms and embraced her, humming fondly as he pulled them apart and stepping back, taking her in. My, you look splendid. All grown up and married. 
She touched her stomach with a tentative smile. And expecting. His face beamed with wide brown eyes as he spread his hands out. Congratulations. Thank you. It's only four months along. I'm lucky. I'm not really showing yet. Mom had a horrible time. Swells up like a balloon just for little old me. He smiled with a slight tilt of the head and took a deep breath. Well, I hear you want to talk to me. Should we go into my office? No, no, it's nothing personal like that. I just wondered if you might translate some Latin for me. She fished in her purse for the note and knitted her brows in plea. It's not very long, so you can get back to whatever you do in your spare time really fast. He hummed and took the note with an amused smile, pulling on his glasses. A little Latin I can handle. Where'd you come across it? He scanned the words and stopped, stiffening and clearing his throat as his eyes flicked up and back to the paper. He read it again. I put it into Google, but you know how accurate that is. You really know Latin, and I trust you, so... I, I could make out the bit about the queen, but I don't really know anything else. He cleared his throat and stepped close, keeping his voice low so it wouldn't echo. It's the creed of the Brotherhood of Ishtar. Sarah furrowed her brows, about to speak as Father Nathaniel continued. The scar on this church's history. The satanic priests? Sarah whispered low, bones aching as she said it in the bowels of the church, like she might sully the sanctity of God. He nodded. It reads, We find rest in you, our queen under the hill. Light comes from darkness, and knowledge from light. He looked down at the note and back to her, shaking the paper as he spoke. Sarah, where did you find out about this? And don't say the internet. The pendants are out there, but we've never let anyone see the back side. They're still fixed in their inlays. Her chest tightened as she thought of the crow and the mushrooms and the beautiful, terrible lady in the window in her dreams. I... I found it. Where? On what? A pendant? Was it in an inlay? Was it in town? Did you steal it? She stepped back. Fingers tight on her purse strap again, brows knitted and mouth agape. No, father. I'm not a good person, but I'm no thief. He shut his eyes and sighed. My apologies. Sarah, I know you're not. But please, you must tell me where you saw this. It was on the back side of what I thought was a coin. Joe did some research and found out what it was. We sold it, because we need the money for the baby. Father Nathaniel squeezed his shut eyes and sighed pulling his glasses free and letting them hang from the hand he pinched the bridge of his nose with. Where'd you find it? He pulled out a cell phone. What are you doing? I said I didn't steal it. And I believe you. But if you found a pendant, then there's likely been a robbery, and we need to investigate. He slipped the note into his jean pocket, dialing a number. Just promise me you won't go looking into this. I won't say you sold it so you won't have to worry about the money, but leave the business with the pendant alone, for your child's sake. She swallowed hard, body awash and cold as terror slid into her voice. W why It's it's not haunted or something, r right? He held the phone to his ear, finding her eyes as tight lips opened to speak. It's a cursed thing from our cursed past. It's dangerous. The forces those priests called up are real. Just... Just don't pursue this. Okay. I'll take over from here. He looked up and straightened. Yes. Hello, sir. It's Father Nathaniel of Our Lady of Perpetual Sorrows, Grimshaw, New York. I need to inquire about a sensitive matter. He pulled the phone back and mouthed. Promise me, Sarah. She looked between his eyes and swallowed, wringing her purse strap with a nod, whispering, I promise. He nodded and turned around, walking back to his office. Yes, sir, I'm still here. No, I need to request a check on items 4A95 through 4A108. Yes, sir. No, sir, I'm concerned. Then his voice was gone. She took a shallow breath and stared at the window with the rising Jesus, thinking, Please, keep my family safe. If nothing else, keep our baby safe. She held her stomach as her guts churned into tangled knots. 
She spun with damp eyes, rushing out of the church into her car, mumbling to herself the whole way. It's just a coin, Sarah, she said in the parking lot. Besides, even if it is cursed, it's not in your house anymore. It's someone else's problem. She reached her car and unlocked it as a rush of black wings filled her mind, turning into night. She squeezed her eyes tight as the darkness became a pale shadow, an unseen dream as real as the wind with beckoning hands and bright, sharp eyes. Stop, she breathed. Stop it. Leave me alone. By the power of Christ, shut your mouths and leave me alone! She shouted the last and opened her eyes on her own reflection, the world silent and still apart from the curious stares that she'd earned. She swallowed and looked around, rubbing her damp eyes as she opened the door and jumped in, rushing down the hill and through the town to the newly built, widely spaced homes. The people, the lights, the cars all passed her by in a blur as her mind reeled and she repeated the words in her head. We find our rest in you, our queen under the hill. Out of darkness comes light, and knowledge from light. She blinked, finding her house before her and the car in park. She unlashed her fingers from the wheel and turned off the ignition, taking a deep breath and letting her eyes drift from the blue stucco walls to the white front door and deck, to the concrete path and the shriveling, dying trail of mushrooms. She, she allowed herself to smile at that small victory. The mushrooms are dying, the pendant's gone, there were no signs of a big predator in the woods, and now we have the money to take care of our baby. Everything's going to be all right, Sarah. She stepped out with a deep breath and gagged, covering her mouth and turning to the gray barrel of the composter. She snarled and walked to the gate of their fence, stomping to the side of the house, biting back bile as she stared at it, and then sprinted to the shed, bringing back a tarp. She laid it out, took hold of the composter, and slammed it down to the ground, letting the dirt and rot spill onto the tarp with a grunt as her dark hair flew in the disjointed wind. She pulled the dark soil beneath and spread out the muck and rot so that she could see all of it, and stopped when she felt something hard. She pulled out a small white rib and grimaced, setting it aside until she found another, and another, quickly making a small pile. I can't believe this! Did Joe put animal bones in the... She sighed and kept searching. He knows better! She scoured the refuse and pulled out a larger bone, bigger than a chicken leg. She furrowed her brows at it, setting it down slowly to keep looking and pulling out another, and a larger rib with sinew, and a pelvis with scraps of meat, and a skull. She rose to her knees and stared at the half-feathered bird skull sitting atop the dirt, and the other older one beside, and the rotting fleshy snake head beside that, and the broken canine jaw beside that. She stumbled back on her hands and knees, rising on shaky feet and looking over it all, her dreams painting the bones with flesh and fur and feather and scales. What the hell? She swallowed pushing the images aside, clamoring for something, anything, grasping for an idea of how a snake might have slithered into the composter for warmth with a dead bird, or how the first dead fox was using the composter as a stash away, or how the little bones could have been splinters from chickens or beef and Joseph was lying about putting meat in the composter. What else could explain it? The memory of blood filled her mouth with crunching bones and snapping sinew the warmth running down her neck and chest and stomach. What else could explain it? Hey y'all. If you can hear my voice, that means that you made it to the end of the video. Thank you for listening to the end. I hope you enjoyed this installment, and if you did, give the video a like and drop a comment. And don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you can stay notified when I upload, every other Friday at 6pm. And while you're at it, Go ahead and share this to someone you think might like listening to my work. It's for a good cause. I promise. Alright, that's it from me now. I'll see y'all next time.